Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to August 1984 to get all the Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games. We bounce around the pyramids with our q shootout. We play some older games. And check out some newer titles. But first, it's back into the time machine in August 1984. Sinclair has confirmed that it has more or less dropped the 16K Spectrum from the UK. It has no plans to advertise the machine on the run up to Christmas, instead, focusing on the 48K model. The main reason for this decision, according to Sinclair, is that 95% of its sales are for the 48K version, which this year will be bundled with special software titles. The much-awaited follow-up to the hit adventure game Valhalla has been announced by Legend. The game will be called The Great Space Race, and according to the company, it will be a spectacular futuristic romp. The game is being heralded as another step closer to the much overused term computer movie. The characters will all be independent and the graphics will have true filled 3D. Let's hope it's not all hype. Thames Television are in negotiations with DKtronics to produce computer games based on its hit program Minder and the Sweeney. There are no fixed details yet, so we don't know what type of games they'll be, or for what machines. Although if DKtronics are involved, no doubt there will be Spectrum versions of the games. Software projects are in talks with the famous US software house Sierra, makers of hit games like King's Quest for the Apple, Atari and IBM machines. Software projects are looking to get the license to convert their games to UK machines, including the Spectrum. The first game to be converted will be BC's Quest for Fire, with hopefully more to follow. A meeting of the creditors of a failed Liverpool-based software house Imagine have been told that the debts are larger than first thought, surpassing £1 million. Not only do they owe Marshall Cavendish £250,000, but £100,000 to the bank and £250,000 in wages, VAT and national insurance payments. Coupled with a £650,000 owed to trade creditors, it's no wonder that the company collapsed. 70s punk band The Stranglers are to release an adventure game as part of their new album, Oral Sculpture. Coming as a separate cassette, the game called Oral Quest is for the Spectrum and is written using the Quill Adventure Creation System. Fuller Electronics, the company providing a series of add-ons for the Spectrum, have gone into receivership. Fuller, along with DKtronics and Quicksilver, were amongst the first companies to provide add-ons for the Spectrum, and after a board meeting they had no choice but to go into voluntary liquidation. And now on to the top-selling games. Games coming into the chart this month include TLL from Vortex, the low-level flying game with great 3D graphics. Star Trader from Bugbyte, the space trading game. Lay Flix from PSS, the adventure game with a touch of Pink Panther. And Full Throttle from Micromega, a nice 3D motorbike racing game. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from August 1984. Yeah. Cubert was released in the arcades in 1982 by Gotilab. Unlike many of its counterparts in the arcades, this game stayed well clear of invading aliens and instead gave the player a nice isometric pyramid with blocks that needed changing colour. The reason for this colour change is not known. There was no end goal, just to survive as long as you could. This is a challenging game with a good learning curve and enough features to make it popular. So popular, in fact, that merchandise from the game is third only to Pac-Man and Donkey Kong, and there was even a cartoon made. There are many elements that developers have to include, like spinning platforms, coiling snakes, multiple colour changes and smooth jumping of the main character. So, how did the Spectrum versions compete? First up we have Bouncing Bertie from Power Software released in 1984. This is the first game we took a look at, and if the quality is anything to go by then this is going to be a tough set of reviews. 
familiar layout of the pyramid looks right, apart from the black and white shading. We could forgive this though if the game played well, but it doesn't. The movement between blocks is instant, there's no actual jumping involved, and the response to key presses is sometimes very slow, meaning you can often die while waiting for the game to respond to your frantic key stabbing. Games can be over quickly too, due to the speed the whole thing plays at, which can get very frustrating. The floating discs that should scoop the player up and take them back to the top of the pyramid are there, but when you use them you just suddenly appear at the top, and usually die straight away because you get hit by one of the regenerating balls. Overall pretty poor, and one to avoid. Next is Crazy Herbert, by Alternative Software released in 1990. Crazy Herbert looks far superior to the last game, and plays much better. The pyramid is nicely coloured, and the main sprite jumps from block to block like the arcade. The pace is just about right, and the game is really nice to play, with nearly all of the elements in place. There are the discs that whisk Herbert back to the top of the pyramid, snakes that make an appearance on later levels, and blocks that require more than one colour change. All this maintains the challenge. Response to controls is good, making it a joy to play and a top contender. The only thing missing is the swear words when Herbert gets killed, but apart from that, a really good effort. Next we have QB from Chad Software, released in 1984. My first problem with this game is the control. It doesn't seem to work with issue 3 keyboards, which took me a while to figure out. It also had problems with joysticks. Anyway, once I'd sorted that out the game started, and we got a nice coloured pyramid with large blocks. The main sprite is also large, but only ever faces in one direction, so we can take a few points off for that. The pace of the gameplay is far too fast, which causes frustration as you die time after time without making much progress. The sprite does jump from block to block and is lifted to the top when using the discs, so it keeps close to the arcade in that respect. Sadly, because of the pace, this game is almost unplayable, a shame really as the graphics are quite nice. Next we have Cuddly Cubert, from Interceptor Software, released in 1983. Here we have another game that suffers badly due to the sheer pace of the gameplay. Had this game been slower, then it would have been a real contender. The pyramid is colourful and the sprites are large and move smoothly around. The player jumps from block to block and the sound effects are good. Sadly, typical games last about 10 seconds and you don't have time to react to the movement of the enemies and end up losing all your lives in a short space of time. Also, when you die, the pyramid sometimes resets, and you lose all of your progress, meaning you have to start again. After having at least 50 attempts at this game, I never managed to get past the first level. The discs do their job, when you can actually get onto them before dying, of course. Such a shame, really. Next we have Ghosty from Load and Run, released in 1986. This game has several differences to the arcade. For example, there are no discs, and in this variant the main character starts in the middle of the pyramid. The pyramid is colourful, but for some unknown reason there's a colour split right down the middle of the screen. This doesn't add anything to the game, so I don't really see the point of it. The main character, looking more like a ghost from Pac-Man than Cubert, hops around nicely while bats replace balls and chase him. The gameplay is the same as the arcade with some nice sound effects and tunes. An element not seen in previous games, or at least presumed not seen because I couldn't get far enough in some of them, is that an enemy arrives and changes back the colours of the blocks already changed. Although not as smooth as some of the previous games, the pace and difficulty are set about right meaning it's quite fun to play, and you find yourself wanting to have another go, something missing from some of the earlier titles we've tested. The gameplay speeds up as you progress, and the number of bats increase, providing a nice progression. Overall, then, a nice little game.
Next we have Hubert from Blabby Computers, released in 1984. Here we have a game that takes the arcade classic and mauls it around to produce a rather poor variant. The pyramid is transformed into a colourful slab of tiles and the gameplay is much the same. Level 1 has no enemies, easing the player into the gameplay. Level 2 and things begin to go wrong though. The balls move too fast again, catching up with Hubert far too quickly, which just produces frustrating gameplay. Hubert doesn't jump smoothly, he just appears in the relevant tiles, as do the chasing balls. Sound is used well, and this is the first game to use the blanked out swear word when Hubert loses a life. Control and response is okay, but can sometimes fail to register a key press. Even so, because of the speed of the game it doesn't really make much difference. There are no discs in this game, but at least we have tiles that require more than one colour change in later levels. A major failure though is the repositioning of Hubert after he dies. Very often a ball will appear at the same point, causing instant death before you have a chance to react. Overall then, an average effort from Blobby, which seems to be the story for most of their early work. Next is Jumpert, released by Your Computer in 1986. Initially I was sceptical of magazine games, but I knew Your Computer did provide some really good examples, and this is one of them. It follows the arcade quite closely, but the main sprite does not jump smoothly as so many of the other games we've tested. The pyramid is nicely coloured and the sound effects are good, but jumping sounds are only played if the tile changes colour, so often near the end of the level the game can become almost silent. The first level is difficult, too difficult I think for a first level, and this is caused by too many chasing enemies. There are three of them on the first level. This spoils an otherwise good game for me. The discs have been replaced by squares, but they do the same job, whisking Jumper back up to the top of the pyramid. This game also has the blanked out square word when you lose a life, so positive marks for that. Marks are lost though, as the progress of the colour changes are lost between lives. Overall a nice game let down by the difficulty of early levels. Next we have Megabird, released by Your Sinclair in 1986. I don't usually include typings in these tests, but I felt it unfair that I allowed Your Computer's game in and not this one, so let's get on with it. As you can probably tell, it's written in BASIC and has all the problems associated with that. It's slow, sometimes unresponsive, the sound is limited to beeps and the collision detection is very hit and miss. Other than that, it's not a bad game for BASIC. The pyramid is nicely coloured and the gameplay is pretty much okay. Not a contender though. Next we have Piebald from Automata, released in 1984. We looked at this game in episode 10, but to sum up though, gameplay wise it's not a bad effort, with the main letdown being the movement of the sprites. Instead of bouncing from block to block they just appear there. This aside, the game isn't too bad though, and good for a few plays. The graphics are nice, and the angle of the pyramid is more acute than the arcade game. Other differences are the speed of the lifts. These seem to move at an alarmingly slow rate, and once you get to the top, you have to jump off yourself. Sound is used sparingly, only played when you appear or die, and progress is lost between lives, which is a real pain. Control is responsive, and even with all its faults, it's still better than some of the other games we've tried. Next is Pogo from Ocean Software, released in 1984. This is Ocean's entry into the Cubit market and it's a damn fine game. The pyramid is nicely coloured and the sprites are large, well defined and well animated. The movement is smooth and gameplay is bang on. The control is very responsive, giving a really nice arcade feel. Sound is used very well throughout, with effects being used for almost every aspect of the game. And we even get the swear word when our hero dies. The 
the discs work as expected, taking the player back up to the top of the pyramid in a timely fashion. And I really enjoyed playing this game, so much so, that I forgot I was supposed to be reviewing it. It's just such a playable and well-crafted game. This is going to take a lot of beating. Next we have Cubert from Parker Brothers, which was never actually officially released. This was one of the games that was going to appear on the ROM cartridges, but never made it. As you would expect from an official game, it follows the arcade very closely. But it was never finished, so don't expect perfection. The keys to play the game are odd, 1, 2, 3 and 4, which takes some getting used to. Although you can use a Sinclair joystick in part 2 if you want, and this is far easier. The gameplay is okay, but I think it's too tough on the initial levels, with lots of enemies to avoid. This is a prototype though, so maybe they were just testing things. Response is sometimes compromised too, especially when there are a lot of things on screen. It's sad that it was never completed, it could probably have been the definitive Cubert. But never mind, as it stands it's a contender anyway, but only just. And by the way, don't press P, it'll crash. Next is Cubertus. The creator and release date are both unknown for this game, but let's get on with it. The game asks for key controls at the start, which is fair enough, but then asks the game before every game, which is odd. Once settled in, the game begins and we get an average implementation, clearly written in basic. The graphics are nice, but not animated and lack smooth movement. Sound is limited to beeps, but the main letdown is responsiveness. The game can take ages to respond to key presses, which in a fast moving arcade game is criminal really. Not a bad game, but certainly not one of the contenders. And lastly we have Spellbound from Beyond Software, released in 1984. Points for taking the game and changing the style, giving it a new theme, and the initial impressions is that it looks really good. Maybe it was designed to look good for magazine adverts, because when the game starts it looks absolutely terrible. The graphics are jerky and not animated, and each move is accompanied by an irritating sound effect. The witch at the top keeps throwing lightning which produces other enemies to chase you, and if you die you lose your progress and have to start all over again, which is a major problem. Control can sometimes be unresponsive too, meaning you either remain still while chasing enemies jump on you, or you throw yourself off a platform and die. All in all, a pretty terrible game. And that's the end of the test. So, which one of the games is the winner? I think you can probably guess by just looking at the videos. The winner is obviously Pogo from Ocean Software. This is just a fantastic implementation of the arcade game. Really nice to play and highly recommended. Cisco Heat was an arcade game released in 1990 by Jellico Entertainment and sees you driving your police car through the streets of San Francisco trying to complete the section in a given time limit. The game was a fast 3D driving game with 90 degree corners, jumps and a lot of traffic to avoid. The arcade game I found to be below average. So what about the Spectrum version? Initially the game was a pain to load. It failed on the plus 3 altogether and when I booted it into plus 2 mode it crashed if I pressed the spacebar. The trick is to let it load to the game screen and then press 0. It will then load the level data and then you're ready to go. Pressing 0 again will start the game. The game window is small, with a wide surround and large timers and speed indicators. The awful tune that plays on the intro does not go away when playing the game, 
and I couldn't find a way to switch it off, and after a few plays it got very annoying. On to the game itself, and my first impressions were terrible. Yes, it had hills, yes, it had jumps, but the view was so awful that you had trouble seeing what was coming next. Control was OK using the cursor joysticks, with Enter to change gear, but you can't get away from the poor visuals. The time limits are very harsh too, giving you very little room for error. If you crash more than once on any particular stage, you probably won't make it to the finish line. When you crash, your calf spins in the air like Outrun, but because of colour clash, you can't really appreciate it, it's just a blur of pixels. Each crash obviously slows you down, losing valuable time, and because of this I never managed to get past the first section, not for want of trying too, I had about 10 attempts, failing each time. My driving in this game didn't really improve because the game throws things at you too quickly. Just as you're reaching the crown of a hill, you can sometimes instantly get met with a huge lorry, with no time at all to manoeuvre. Feature-wise it has most of the arcade elements, 90 degree corners, other cars, large lorries, street cars, jumps, crossings and hills. Sadly though, because of the size of the window and the gameplay, it's nowhere near as enjoyable to play as the arcade, and even that was mediocre. Using the infinite time poke, I found the other levels just to be the same, except with more tight turns, meaning that you have less chance of finishing. The most annoying thing I found is when another car blocks you. Your speed drops to around 35 miles per hour, then you just hear a clicking noise. Because the sprites are the same, you sometimes can't even tell, and this causes delays in games that doesn't give you much room as it is to slow down. Overall, then, a poor game in most aspects, and that tune drives me mad. It's the year 2079, and the Earth has been neglected by the human race, with only a few areas of natural beauty left. These areas must be defended at all costs, and that's where you come in. You are a warden, responsible for keeping out the aliens that threaten to ruin these last few areas. As you've guessed it, Energy Warrior is a horizontal shoot -em up just what I like. You fly around shooting various aliens that come at you in different formations. Some just fly in a set pattern, others swirl around and are attracted to you. Luckily your ship handles well and your lasers can blast them into little bits. You also have smart bombs, although in this game they're called blitz bombs. These wipe out anything on screen. Like all good shoot ups there are power ups of sorts. These appear after shooting certain alien types and give you a chance to do one of several things. You can increase your energy, you can increase the aura, you can get more blitz bombs, and if you see a key you can move on to the next level. On first play of the game it didn't seem quite right. This was because it wasn't like most horizontal shooter ups in that the movement is not constant. The movement is controlled by you, so you can actually stay still if you wanted. Once you get used to this, the game soon begins to grow on you. The graphics are really nice, with four levels of parallax scrolling and great detail in the backgrounds. Sound could have been better though with just a few effects for firing and explosions, and there's also new music on the 48k machine. The aliens are depicted in various forms, some typical alien-like, others rather odd, for example you'll find a snowman and something that looks like burgers. You also get human heads and cakes. After a few plays I found myself really enjoying this game and wanted to try again just to get a little bit further. The graphics for each level change to keep things interesting, and all in all it's a nice blaster. It takes much from Defender, and adding multi-levels and detailed graphics while at the same time slowing down the game pace, the end result of which is a nice little game. Why don't you give it a try? Your skills are needed by the Intergalactic Space Rescue Service to rescue stranded spaceships and their crews. To help you, their distress signal can be used to track them. 
helping you locate their position. This game sets you in a 10x10 grid, each holding unknown elements of space. Sometimes there's just nothing but open space, and this lets you continue on your journey in search of the stranded spaceships. Run into asteroids though, and this will reduce your fuel, of which you have a limited supply. Luckily, there are also planets around, which can refuel your ship. You'll also run into wormholes. These whisk you off into a different sector. The screen shows your fuel on the left hand side, and the strength of the distress signal on the right. Using both of these carefully will see your mission be successful. This game reminds me a little bit of Mind Out by Quicksilver, but with added features and better gameplay. The control is good, with your ship moving in character squares, but that doesn't really matter for this type of game. Sound is used only when colliding with things, which is a bit of a shame. It would have been nice to have a little blip sound or something for every time you moved, because if you start moving through empty space, the game is silent. Overall, a nice game that can fill in a good 30 minutes or more. Considering it's only 16k as well, there's nothing to stop you giving it a try. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.